Welcome back to the channel. You didn't think I'd be back, did you? You thought I was gonna be streaming, writing indefinitely in video games, but no, here I am. Back in December, I completed NaNoWriMo successfully, met a lot of great new people, enjoyed streaming. I found that I really enjoyed streaming, and so I think I'm gonna continue to do so. Uh, my writing, as well as some gaming you may have seen. Now I'm streaming both on YouTube here and Twitch. I'm still undecided as to which platform is best for me. So if you have any opinions on that or you prefer me to stick on YouTube so you don't have to go to two places or you think Twitch is where you stream, get the hell off YouTube with the streaming crap, let me know in the comments. But as I said before I left in my uh, telemarketing headphone update, I'm back to creating content, my writing with my worth 1000 words as you're watching right now, as well as my movie reviews and TV reviews and book reviews. And I, I do know that I promised to release the Piranesi review, the novel by Susanna Clark, but after I watched it, it was unbearable. So rather than making you suffer through that, I'm going to record it again. Maybe I've, I've learned some things or realized some things and letting that novel sit at the back of my head for the last 30 days. And actually, it did influence some of my approach to the novel I wrote, the, the draft one manuscript anyway, which maybe I'll talk about on a NaNoWriMo update. But we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about worth 1,000 words. You're here to see me attempt to do a short story of exactly 1,000 words based on a piece of artwork. And today I have a really, really cool piece of artwork it stood out like crazy to me on the, on the thumbnail list on ArtStation. And I'm sure when you see it, you will know why. I think I'm going to repeat myself in the artwork section because I did record that before this. But anyway, I think it's going to be a good time. I hope you enjoy it. But before I go, before I show you the artwork, as you know, I enjoy listening to music while I write. And I had to revisit my old friend Richard Skelton because when you see the image, I think that you will know that the quality of his music matches it perfectly. And the album I chose was The Complete Marking Time. So I encourage you to check it out, maybe listen to it while I read the story, or while you read the story if you check it out in text form on my website. Anyway, I'm done with the rambling. Let's get on with the artwork. Let's check it out right now. Today's artwork is titled Harvest, and it's by an artist named Eugene Meslovsky from Minsk, Belarus. And this one really stood out in the thumbnails and i'm sure you can see why we have these these women who at first glance look like they're just walking across this field but we soon realize if you pay careful attention the women farthest into the distance look as though they're undead and as if they're transforming as they get closer and closer to the camera or whatever direction they're headed to and we can see some crosses out in the distance perhaps as some kind of burial ground of some kind and these these women are rising from the dead and we also have these giant floating skeletons with crown these these ringed crowns and they're missing their lower half of their body and the birds seem to be enjoying them at least and there's a there's a nice little detail off to the left here too there's these bird houses on the trees so this image definitely has an interesting story to tell and what i love is that everyone is looking away from the camera, right? So typically in, in a lot of art like this, you have the focal point um, of the, or the character or the hero of the piece looking at something or heading towards something. And it's usually within the camera's view. It's usually in the distance. It might be within the frame itself even. But here we have a woman closest to the camera completely cut off. And it just really makes your eye go to that direction and want to just like look beyond the edge of the painting. And I, I really love what he did here, even though the skeletons kind of dominate the, the image in the upper left side and just the composition in general, you're still drawn to that right side. Like what are these women running toward? And while this may be against a lot of, I guess, classical composition I feel like it's it's really bringing something new. So I'm really excited for this one. Eugene, thank you so much for painting this and inspiring me to write a story about it. Hopefully I can do it some justice. All right, let's see what I came up with. Morning's dreams bring bitter things. Chase the caw to catch them all. Light ye lantern, else all be lost. Run to sunset or pay the cost. 
It was time, the giggled words told me. Little Gretchen had a fluted voice, a most pleasant melody to wake to. I leaped up with clawed fingers. Lest rogues of night steal your sight, they pluck your eyes and feast on thighs. Gretchen squeaked, pale as the moon. Twilight tears bubbled from deep blue eyes. Oh no, 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 I said, taking her into my arms. I'm playing with you, little sister. Gretchen wriggled from my arms and dashed out the door. The sunset painted my room all the colors you could imagine. Warms and cools and in-betweens. A raven cod. It was time. I gathered my shoes and picked my way across the stony yard, kicking them off when I reached the soft grass. Others gathered, primping themselves in the violet haze. Little ones I saw about, tugging on dresses, but Gretchen I could not find. Gretch! I called. Everyone looked at me but her. I decided to move on. I couldn't be late for summer of night. Wreaths and bonnets were dawn, braids as gold as the sun-kissed grass fluttering behind the women who charged ahead. I took my time. I didn't need to be first to greet the men, who were surely ready with some trick, some silly game to frighten us all. Great half-skeletons they had last year, finely made and quite realistic. They had been cleverly affixed to a mechanism that would make them leap into the air when we approached. Scared us to the grave, nearly. Little Gretchen wouldn't sleep alone for weeks. Even ring their heads with the sunset crown. Blasphemers, mother had called them. All mothers. Theirs and not alike. Anyhow, I learned my lesson. To the back with me. Fairy fire glowed, trapped in lantern glass. Oh no, I said. I'd forgotten the lantern. Light ye lantern, else all be lost. An impish voice growled behind me. Jump I did, nearly wet myself. I turned to find Gretchen hunched in a devilish pose, a lit lantern gripped in her chubby hands. You little sister of night, I said. But you are right, I did forget, only because I was looking for you. Gretchen stuck her tongue out at me, to which I responded with a firm tickle under her chin. Her giggles hinted to me everything was okay again. Her smile confirmed it was. Hand in hand we went, kicking up soil and insect alike, making up other rhymes that brought eye rolls and smirks from the other girls. They never appreciated our creativity. The rise of the field was plain in view, and I wondered what secrets the men waited with. I'd let the first wave pass. Never again would I be the first to fall prey. Nothing. They looked around in confusion, as did I, though I wasn't near. Then we heard another song, an unpleasant one. It spoke in sharpened blades and spears. Our ears we had to cover. Some dropped their lanterns before dropping to their knees. From the cacophonous song or the black wave of birds rushing above, I wasn't sure. I lowered myself into the grass just in case. Then the birds met a wall as dark as them. Men, not our men, on horseback. Bloodied swords and spears alike, smoke rising from what they had done. By the mother of morn, they waited for us. Torches fell to the ground to consume the harvest. They galloped toward us, a single entity, hacking down the first line of girls before they could stand. Heads tumbled through the air, flickering the fire of the sun. Our girls brought screams of their own, sobbing, pleading. Mercy none of us got. Bodies were cleaved. The soil itself bled. I took Gretchen into my arms and ran. To where should I go? The field was as wide and clear as the sea, and it felt like I waded through its depths. I could not escape. The trees were my only hope. Maybe I could get lost among them until night fell. And then what? The birdhouses nailed to the trunks glimmered, showing us the way. We turned and ducked, slid and stumbled. For a moment I was convinced we were going to make it. I found a burrow to squirm into. But Gretchen would have none of it. Let me go! She shouted and wriggled from my arms, right into a horseman's pike. Then my own screams escaped, echoing hers. No words I could find. Sounds, yes. So many sounds that meant nothing and everything. The man dismounted with Gretchen still speared, and he walked to me. Limp arms swung, her head bobbed. Tiny feet danced by their bare toes. He brought her to me, at least, and I held her. Pulled her from the spear I could not, but at least I could never let go. And as my own twilight came, one which I was thankful to not feel, I sang her a song. Morning's dreams bring bitter things. Chase the caw to catch them all. Light ye lantern, else I'll be lost. Run to sunset, or pay the cost. It is time. Gretchen giggles and runs out the door. I follow, 
forgetting my lantern, as always. It's all right. I know that I do not need it. The great skeletons fly now, no longer absent of life, no longer the games of dead men we will never see again. Bone I am first, brittle and cold. But as I walk, I become beautiful again, just as Gretchen. It pains me to see her this way, though I have known since the first time we woke that she will be whole again, if but for a moment. I take her hand, I take my time. I know what the sunset brings. So, funny thing, this uh, little poem came to me immediately when looking at this image. I, I didn't know where I was going, I did know that my, I wanted the POV character to be one of these women initially, and I decided very quickly that there wouldn't be one woman, but there would be two. And here we have little Gretchen, who is our secondary character, our supporting character, singing this song to her sister. But uh, as sibling relationships generally go, we have a little bit of a, our protagonist uh, <laughs> leaps up with clawed fingers and says, lest rogues of night steal your sight, they pluck your eyes and feast on thighs. And she decides to console her once she sees her poor little sister is crying. Because you've heard the story already, you'll know that there was, and it's funny, I didn't realize it until after the fact, but that's a, that's a nice callback when Gretchen wriggles from her arms and dashes out the door. That comes into play during the conclusion. And I'm introducing the ravens here that are present, or maybe they're not ravens, they're birds of some kind, but they look like ravens to me. We are having our, our protagonist dive out into this grass, into this view you see right here. Not necessarily this moment, but I needed to establish this part here visually because I decided very early on that I wanted to come back to it. Because I think you'll notice that if you see the characters in the background, they look undead almost. And then if you look at the characters in the foreground, they're very beautiful, they're very much alive, or at least appear to be so. And I imagine this cyclical thing where these characters they rise from the dead upon this occasion, whatever it may be. And I decided right here, it is called Summer of Night. And that is an homage to one of my favorite horror books of all time, Summer of Night by Dan Simmons. Highly recommend it if you haven't heard of it. But now I'm painting the picture of these women, the wreaths on their heads and the bonnets and, and kind of seeding the idea of these skeletons here because they are very dominant in the image and I could not just leave them behind. And my best idea was to have them be a remnant or an image of what these men did, these, these men that they're presumably going to meet. Almost like a specter of an idea. I guess. And here we are bringing the lantern in, um, and I brought the two sisters back together right here because uh, I needed a reason, or I needed a, a wave to bring them back, and I thought that um, her forgetting the lantern would be a good idea, since the little sister uh, kind of got the, the butt end of the joke, or, or the scare, and I, I wanted a little bit of payback there, and so that's what I did. As siblings do, tend to do, they, they make up, and they, they run hand in hand, um, kicking up soil and insects, making up rhymes, and uh, the rest of the women aren't very impressed. And here I'm starting to get toward the midpoint. So I just hit 500 words. And what I like to do there, if you've watched any of these videos, is start ramping things up to the conclusion so I don't run out of words. And I'm starting to reveal the mystery. What has happened? What are these girls heading toward? Well, we know they're headed toward these men, but something's not quite right. They hear this unpleasant song, these birds that are just soaring across the field behind them. And you can see in the background, there's, there's quite a few of them back there. So I just imagine this very cacophonous sound, this song. And now I introduce the antagonist, the men and not our men on horseback, bloodied swords and spears alike, smoke rising from what they had done. So immediately I just have these ominous figures on horseback who have have killed these men that they were they were going toward and 
without any sort of buildup, they start hacking down these women completely, kind of you know turning them as as we as we know they are or have been killed, and they are returning from the dead. So I had to get them there somehow. But what is going to happen to our protagonist and her little sister? Well, you know that already if you've um, listened to the story. They're going to the forest. Um, I noticed these little small details on these trees off the left, which were interesting. And I didn't know really what significance to give them. Um, I just had them become a, a, a visual indicator for these characters. Maybe they can seek um, shelter in the trees. And here we are. The, yeah, the birds nailed nailed to the trunk for the trucks. And I think it's funny. I think trucks remains in there. I didn't catch it on the uh, the second pass. Our poor unnamed protagonist is convinced she's going to escape. But this is the callback I was talking about. Let me go. She shouted and wriggled from her arms right into Horseman's Pike. So just as she dashed out the door initially, she dashes out of this burrow, out of her sister's arms, and is killed. And I think, too, what I wanted to do is not not so much because I didn't have a lot of words left, but because I think sometimes these impactful scenes tend to be more impactful when they happen suddenly. There's not a buildup. There's no time for your brain to determine what's going to happen. It just happens in front of your eyes, and that's it. And I had this interesting image in my head of of Gretchen kind of impaled on this on the spear and just kind of almost like a puppet hanging from a marionette strings. And that's that's where I got that image from. And here I'm coming back. So because I wanted this whole thing to be cyclical, I am coming back to the beginning. And you'll notice here that the tense has changed. So now I'm in present tense. I have written that way a few times, but here it definitely has a significance. And that significance is it is now. Whereas uh, the rest of the story, the previous part of the story, was in past tense. And uh, here I brought the skeletons back in, um, the, the symbols of these men who have died, and um, also illustrating her turning from bone and, and rotted flesh into beautiful porcelain. And what I wanted to do too is have her know this fact. So um, as I go through my second pass... I want her to realize. So, you know, she it pains her to see this way. She should have known the first time. She has time. I don't need to run. I know what the sunset brings. And so it's almost this, it's just this tragic tale of, it's, it's one thing when a ghost doesn't know what's going to happen. But I think it's all the more tragic when they know what's going to happen every time. So this, this woman, she knows she's going to see her sister die in front of her eyes. Again and again and again. Yeah, this one was, I, I, I'm pretty happy with how it came out. I, I liked it from like the, the cyclical standpoint because I'm a huge sucker for that stuff. But I think stories, it's important to know where you're going to end and, and the beginning and the end need to mirror each other in a way. And I know this was a very literal mirror to a degree, but um, even if you're doing it with subtext or, or metaphor or something like that, your ending will be more powerful because of that. And um, I'm sure if you think of some of your favorite stories, you'll, you'll agree. You'll, you'll find those, those cues. And I actually hit this under an hour. I believe it's at 54 minutes, which was uh, great. And I have this going at five times speed. I feel like it's a little too quick. I can't even keep up with uh, the playback at certain points. So forgive me if my narration is a little bit off. I'll probably go back to four next time but here we are wrapping up doing just a final edit pass a quick edit pass i try to keep these at least around the hour mark because as you know you could you could edit and edit and edit forever but the point of this exercise is to crank something out quickly try to tell a complete story and edit it at least to some degree and that's it all right full disclosure I wrote the story twice. I know that sounds like cheating, but I don't know if it was because I was nanoed out still. I was nanorimoed out and I didn't quite know where to begin, what to do. And I know that that happens a lot and I tend to figure it out as I go. And I did figure something out from the first draft, 
but I didn't like it as much. And I, and I walked around the block as, as I tend to do when I, I am out of ideas or I'm a, I'm a little lost in what I want to do. And it came to me. My problem was point of view. So I can't stress this enough. Know your point of view. And I know that sounds obvious, but it really is more than that. It's just how you approach it, the voice in which you're telling the story, how things look, how they smell, how they taste, how people sound. All of that stuff is reliant upon the POV. And and after I got back from my walk, I decided that I really needed to create the POV from someone inside the painting itself. Whereas my first POV was someone who existed off screen, which it's totally doable. I did it in one of my uh, past ones anyway. And I think that one worked. This one just didn't work for me. I don't I don't know why. And it just kind of screwed up the whole story, the whole vibe of the artwork. And I said, you know what? I got to throw it away. I chose one of the women in the painting, as you now know, if you've made it this far. And I felt like it was a much more successful narrative that way. I felt like creating that cyclical nature. I know I'm a sucker for cycles and stories. I'm, I'm a sucker for having things come back full circle, uh, beginning where you end and end where you begin. And I felt like just the nature of this image really fit in with that idea, right? You have these people rising from the dead, turning to life, and I could only imagine that this thing just kept happening over and over and over. And hopefully I conveyed that in the story. I don't know if I did, let me know. But that was my goal, is to just convey the fact that these events had already transpired, these poor women had suffered their fate, and they were locked in this just endless loop. And I think there's something powerful to be said there, and, and I feel like that story fits the message much better than the first one. So I hope you forgive me. I still didn't outline it. I still just had a seed of an idea. I just needed to know that POV. And I think I did it. I think I did it. And as always, I love your suggestions. If you have a piece of artwork that you really admire or you just saw and you, you're wondering like, well, what story could this tell? What story could this create? Send it my way. As much as I enjoy scouring ArtStation, I think that People submitting artwork to me that I may have not have chosen really not only provides a challenge for me, but it makes it more fun. I mean, I, I, I take what I'm given and just go with it versus trying to maybe find a piece of artwork that fits my personal aesthetic. So please submit it. Don't be shy. A few of you have done so already and thank you for it. All right, I'm signing off now. Thanks for watching. Keep reading and keep writing. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye. If you'd like to read this story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't add anything else. Promise. Thanks again.